I welcome you to this uh, very special uh, IEEE meeting. Uh, you know that we have regular meetings uh, every month, but we also have some special meetings when there is an occasion. Uh, and this time uh, we have uh, the pleasure of uh, being hosts to Leslie Martinich, a mm -hmm. distinguished lecturer from IEEE. And uh, she's here uh, thanks to distinguished lecture program of IEEE and uh, also our IEEE chapter, um, education chapter here in Zagreb. Um, Leslie actually had uh, two jobs we gave her. Yesterday we had, uh, there is a MIPRO conference in Opatia and uh, for the first time in MIPRO we introduced also the section on engineering education. Um, and this was the, we had first presentations and Leslie was kind enough to travel all the way from Austin, Texas uh, to give us a lecture. Yesterday the lecture was about creativity, how important creativity in engineering education is. And uh, today we asked her to give us um, another view uh, that she has uh, in, in the whole realm of educating uh, engineers. Uh, and she will talk about, as you can see, problem solving creativity and ethics. And uh, Maya Matyashevich, uh, our chairman of uh, our PhD committee, uh, is uh, just now told us that uh, one of the requirements that we have and also the accreditation bodies have is to introduce uh, something about ethics in PhD studies, but I believe it should also start from the year one of studying. Although uh, now as a teacher, the first year for the freshmen, I can tell you it's, it's a hard job um, to, to do with freshmen because they are very relaxed and they still don't understand what university is. By the end, now they're about to, to finish the first year, they still call themselves pupils, not students. They <laughs> don't understand where they come. Uh, when you tell them that are future engineers and that they're pride and, and, and foundation for the future of this nation, they simply don't understand what I'm talking about. Uh, but still, we'd like to hear from Leslie. Short introduction, Leslie is a techie. She's an engineer. Um, for some of us old enough, uh, it will Definitely be old enough. relevant when we say that Leslie helped uh, design remote procedure calls uh, protocol, which is base for today's cloud computing and some of us used it when we were much younger to communicate among other computers. Um, she also knows how to design a compiler. Guess what? <laughs> but uh, as many of us, uh, later she found her passion in helping others grow into successful uh, professionals but also successful businesses. So she worked with a range of startups, also with great names like IBM, HP, Compaq, Novell, whoever remembers those companies. I know, it's so <laughs> sad. Three <laughs> and others. <coughs> and then um, also here she has this experience in uh, helping uh, professionals and organizations uh, to uh, assume their leadership role. Leadership in technology, but also in leading nations. And uh, Leslie has experience uh, serving, I don't know how to pronounce the correctly the title, but she was actually serving as a professional aide or consultant to uh, U.S. congressmen um, in a program that they have in, in the States where uh, professionals spend one year uh, trying to help uh, uh, draft le legislation and actually push technology and uh, technology-based development of our country in the right direction, something we miss here in Croatia. We don't have such programs. We don't have some support for our members of the parliament. Um, so it was very interesting talking to her about her experience uh, and how do they do it. Maybe we managed to organize something like this because uh, people who lead the country don't have technical competences, technological competences, and we somehow need to provide them, provide it to them. But now, <coughs> to, sh to finally stop talking, uh, <laughs> Leslie, please. Thank you, Padraig. All right, that was a wonderful introduction. Thank you very much, Padraig. Is my microphone on for you? Okay, very good. All right, I'm gonna talk today about um, engineering education and some of the things that are useful and important for educators to do in order to help students move to the future. So let me see where, how this works. So all, in my career, I always had, and I, I, usually, I always had an office and a whiteboard in my office. And on my whiteboard, I would always write, all is flux. And that's from the 6th century BC from Heraclitus, a Greek philosopher. All is flux. And, and it had various meanings to Heraclitus and others, such as 
no man can step into the same river twice. And that is because the river is always moving. It's never the same. So all is flux. And that's from, oops, that's from Herac there's, there's my friend Heraclitus. And the other uh, thing I wrote on my whiteboard was not to decide is to decide. And that's from our friend Jean-Paul Sartre, 20th century French philosopher, existentialist. And what that means is if you don't decide about some question, you're letting fate take the decision. If you say, well, I just can't figure out whether I want to get married or not, well, fate will take that decision for you, and you won't get married or you will, depending on other factors. But it's not your choice. So not to decide is to decide to let others decide for you. That, does that make sense to you guys? So I'm going to talk today a little bit about uh, all the things that you as engineering educators have to consider. You have to consider teaching the basics and really giving people a great fundamental knowledge of the basics. But then you also have to teach them things that are fairly new technologies, like nanotechnologies and robotics and uh, next generation communications. And then on top of that, you also need to teach them writing skills, teamwork, net, uh, how to network. We, Pradrag and Yura and I talked about the value of networking and how you really can get things done through having a network. And on top of that, you need to teach them things that are on the frontiers of your field. And that's really kind of crushing you down, sort of weighing on you. And now we're going to talk about doing something more. And in addition to all those things, I want to talk about how you can teach people critical thinking skills, creativity, and ethics. So now you're totally crushed because there's just too much work to do. How can, how can you do all of that? That's a lot. So we're going to talk about a few ways to, uh, to do that. So we are very fortunate to live in a time when technology has provided us the tools to put a man on the moon, to build self-driving cars, to build weather forecasts. <laughs> Alexander doesn't like that, self-driving cars. I can see from his eyes were rolling. Uh, to, to build weather forecasting systems that enable us to uh, to do things like go online and make uh, plans for a, a travel to another country. Those are things that you couldn't do uh, when, when Z and I were growing up. You couldn't do those things. And uh, Z and I share some growing up history. So now we can do all those things. And we also have mountains of data. There are more sensors out there than people. So trillions of sensors providing lots of data about lots of things. So how can we make sense of that? So this is the mountain of data that it's important to get uh, students to be able to work through. How, how, what are they going to do with that, that mountain of data? How are they going to figure out what to do? Do, we ha do I have a problem? Oh, no. <laughs> Sorry. Um, how are we going to figure out, how are our students going to figure out what to do with all of that data? So I'm going to give you a, a little story about, about that. So this is the enterprise network map for a company called SolarWinds. And in uh, one location, they have engineers monitoring the incoming data. And they're monitoring the incoming data. 
and they start to get a bunch of alerts, alerts that something is wrong. But they don't know what to do about it, and because they haven't yet developed the critical thinking skills, John here, who's their manager and who lives thousands of miles away and is asleep while all of these alerts are coming off, and this guy is just sitting there with his finger in his mouth. Uh, he's not doing anything. John's asleep, and he's not telling the guy what to do. And it's not just one guy, it's multiple. So these multiple guys see all these alerts, and when they think John's woken up, they call him and they say, what should we do? And they couldn't figure out what to do about the alerts until they asked their manager how to handle the, the alerts. Now the value to John, their manager, by the way, his name is John Martinich, he's my son. So he's another Croatian. <laughs> the, the value to John is that these people can handle the alerts while he is sleeping because they have a 24-hour operation, obviously. But if they don't know how to handle the alerts, if they don't know how to take action, and they're just, they're just expecting that their boss is going to tell them what to do, then they're of no value to him, because he might as well do it himself if he has to tell them what to do every time they get an alert. It's just the way our young engineers are going out into the world. They have to be able to know how to take in the information and make some decisions and take some action. If they don't, they're not very useful. John's a very good engineer. <laughs> so now I'm going to tell you a little bit about something that I didn't know was currently available, but it is. This is a picture of uh, some guy in Dubai and some guy from China, and this is in, in Dubai, and between them they have created an autonomous aerial vehicle, a, a vehicle that is capable of taking a person from one place to another in a little helicopter type vehicle, but that person doesn't have to drive it, it's autonomously driven. So, Alexander, even worse than the autonomous car. Sorry, sorry. <laughs> uh, so th this is. A yeah, this is. Well, I'm thinking about what's it going to be like in my sky. You know, I can see the sky from my house, and now it's going to be filled with these things flying around with people in them. I'm not too happy about that. So let me uh, show you a little bit about that. Let's see if I can just click on this. So this is a test flight of this autonomous vehicle in, uh, I think it's in Guangzhou in China. Let's get rid of you. So here's these poor innocent people sitting by their car, standing by their cars, and all of a sudden a vehicle comes out of the sky with a person in it. <laughs> okay, yeah, we're almost done. I think that that's pretty interesting that they have that. And the company is called eHang, which, whoops, sorry. We'll see about going here. Left, 
All right, so we have to teach. I'm good. It, oh. Thank you. So this, this slide is intentionally black so that I can talk. <laughs> uh, we have a lot of things that we have to teach our student, but we can't imagine all the future things that they're going to encounter. Z and I talked about how when we were students, we were using slide rules to do calculations. And then we had little um, calculators. And the calculators were very expensive and they even had a calculator, uh, what was it called? So it was an, a piece of equipment that you screwed into your desk and it, it then created, oh, a cradle. And it created a place to put your calculator and then close it and lock it so you could leave it at work locked on your desk. Now, <laughs> that, that's a different era. But that's when we were learning how to be engineers. How could we have thought about teaching our students things like smartphones, the communications technology that we have, much less autonomous drones with, that carry people? So we couldn't have envisioned that. And I, I suspect that you will recognize that you couldn't envision all the things that you're teaching your high school students today and that others are teaching and that, and that you're as teaching his college students. What, what can we imagine that's going to be in the future? There's so much that we, we can't. So what we need to teach our students is how to learn and how to be perpetually ready to embrace change. We can't teach them what's coming, but we can teach them how to learn so that they're ready for what's coming. Does that make sense to you? Yes. Okay, very good. All right, so I think these are not easy things to do. So I've got a few uh, thoughts about things we can do, and you probably already know them, and you probably all already do them, but one is to use problem-based learning, and Another is to go from uh, keeping it real, to go from specifics, real examples, and as I was talking about yesterday, real stories. So I just told you the story that Z and I used slide rules to do our work. That's a story that's very brief, doesn't take very long, but it, it illustrates how much change has happened in the time that we've been working and then to promote active learner. And I know that's what you guys are doing in your, in your class, is teaching people how to be active learners. Is that widespread in the university? No. No, nope. you're just piloting that so others can learn from you? Okay, so pay attention when, when Predrag and, and Yuri talk. All right, so now I'm going to do something different, and that is we're going to try this out. And there's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven. And Marco, do you want to play in this game too? Sure. Good. <laughs> That's 12 people. So I want you to divide into three groups of four. And look, you already have four there and four back there. And Marco joins these guys, and you'll have three groups of four people. And I'm going to give you an example, and it's a mini ethics class, so a mini ethics lesson. And we're going to start with Confucius. And I, I'm going to give you a mini ethics lesson and then a problem to solve, and then you will figure it out using the tools I give you. Okay, we're going to start with Confucius. So Confucius is, uh, let's see, 6th century BC, um, and he wanted to talk about living a virtuous life, as did Aristotle, our next, our next guest. Uh, and his question that you can boil it down to 
to ask yourself a simple question is, would your parents be happy about it, it being the decision or the choice that you're going to make? Remember, this is an ethical decision. And in engineering ethics, the choices are often um, a little more abstract, but sometimes they're very concrete choices. But we're going to talk about a problem in a minute. So would your parents be happy about it? And then here's Aristotle, 5th century BC in Greece. And Aristotle wants to know, can you sleep at night? That's another question that you can ask yourself to help you decide if the decision you're about to make is an ethical decision or not. The amazing thing is some people can sleep at night <laughs> without any ethical decisions. The next, um, the next ethical theorist uh, of note is Immanuel Kant, 16th century, I think, and um, yeah, 18th century German philosopher. And Immanuel Kant is known for what's called the categorical imperative. Categorical means all, the, everything in this category, everything, and imperative means must. So the question for, for you with respect to the categorical imperative in Immanuel Kant is, what if everybody did this? And that in ter turns out to be a useful question. And our next philosophers of ethics are Jeremy Bentham and John Stuart Mill. And um, they lived in, let's see, in 19th century in England. And their question is, what's the greatest good for the greatest number? That's called utilitarianism. So I've just given you four theories of ethical quest uh, of ethical discovery but they but I've boiled them down and and my friends in philosophy who hear that I can talk about ethics in 5 minutes say that's ridiculous they need at least 5 months so <laughs> but I know for engineers that they're only going to give me 5 minutes so okay. what would your parents think can you sleep at night what's the greatest good for the greatest number oh and I missed the other one uh, what if everybody did this? Thank you. So I want to talk just for another minute about my friend uh, Jeremy Bentham here. Jeremy, this is so you'll remember this. Jeremy Bentham is a professor at the University of London, and he liked faculty meetings so much. How many of you like faculty meetings? <laughs> Maybe. But you're not going to want to do what Jeremy Bentham did. Jeremy Bentham did not want to miss any faculty meetings, so he decided that after he died, his body should be stuffed and brought out for all faculty meetings. So here's Jeremy Bentham, and he's in his little telephone booth thing and being wheeled out to uh, a faculty meeting. I provide that so that you won't forget this lecture. <laughs> you might not remember anything else about it. And, and we, <laughs> Prodragon, Yuri, and I talked about stories and the value of that in cementing your memory. So that's, uh, that's to help you with your memory. So now I'm going to give you this um, example to which you can apply the four questions of what, what is the right ethical choice. So this is a, an example called the visiting professor. So Dr. Lee is an engineering professor at X University, and his department hosts Dr. Visitor, a famous engineering professor at another university for three months. And Dr. Visitor observes Dr. Lee's labs, his meetings, his work, and then six months later, Dr. Lee goes to publish his research and finds that Dr. Visitor has recently published the same information, information without mentioning Dr. Lee. This might be thought of as plagiarism, stealing, stealing ideas, not treating him fair, not, not respecting his work, certainly. 
So what should Dr. Lee do? And that's the question I pose to you. If you were Dr. Lee, what would you do? <laughs> and, and so uh, I want you to discuss the case for five minutes among the four of you in each team. And which of the four approaches seems to help you? And then pick one person to report. One person's going to report back to the rest of the group. And uh, use the questions below to guide your approach. Would your parents be happy? Can you sleep at night? What if everybody did? What if everybody did that? We wouldn't have any incentive for doing good research because somebody else might just steal it. And what's the greatest good for the greatest number? Those are all reasonable questions about what Dr. Lee should do. But each one of you will want to choose uh, your own questions. So uh, would you like me to go back? I, I'm going to put the, um, put the, the situation up for you to see. And I'm hoping you can remember the four questions. I won't put those back up. but. Okay, get together with your group, five minutes, discussion, and, um, <laughs> and think about what Dr. Lee, what you as Dr. Lee should do. So Z, can you wor work with, uh, with Alexander and Marco and... I didn't get your name. I'm Leslie. Sonia. This Sonia. is the story of my life. <laughs> <laughs> I always very serious. I always use in my engineering ethics, I always use examples from my life. From my life. I use real examples. This one is not from my life, but usually it is. I use real examples and that's a really important part of of the teaching of engineering ethics. So this is very often there's so much so now you have to think about the four questions which one would guide you what you would choose to do and then who's going to report
Do you need five more minutes? Or are you ready? Do you need one more minute? Five? Five? Okay. Five more minutes. They need five more minutes there. It's a very hard problem. They need five more minutes, so I give everybody five more minutes. <laughs> I think they. I think they wanted. Okay, I think they wanted 20 more minutes, but I can't give them that. Thank <laughs> you. 
Okay, one minute. <laughs> one minute. We, we, we resolve all ethical dilemmas. Yes, so the, resolve the them all. Okay, good. We uh, have a nuclear bomb and we say this. Good, I hope you destroy the bombs and all the guns too. <laughs> one minute to wrap it up and decide who will present to the group. Okay. All right, let's have some presentations.
And I want to ask each group to present, choose one person from your group to present, and I want to encourage you to present in Croatian so that you can be as exact and effusive as you want to be. So this group had the most energy behind us, so which one of you is going to present? Sonia? Come on. And you, you can present in Croatian if you like, because... No, no me. <laughs> but I, it's fine with me, because I think it will allow you to get your point across easily. So I wanted to make it easy for you. Mm-hmm. And expecting that uh, the, the institute would, would be accepted uh, for that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> going in a different way, but it's not good. Uh, I have uh, really, really different consequences of that. Mm -hmm. But I'm still optimistic that I will do something with that. Mm -hmm. uh, so, so sort of a mix. So this, uh, this was the conclusion to, mm -hmm. to, to think about the consequences. So maybe do nothing. Huh? Are you suggesting maybe do nothing? Yeah. And I have a parallel, uh, I made my parallel story. But I'm not the same uh, with the, the results that we saw in the Ukraine. Mm -hmm. I made them in another way. So let me ask this group, did, did you think about any of the four questions? What would your parents think? Can you sleep at night? <laughs> my None. parents wouldn't be happy. Would be <laughs> okay. Well, thank you very much. Oh, no, sorry at all. All right, how about this group over here? Who is your chosen presenter? So we derived a set of three if-else things that we would try. The first one would be to invite the doctor visitor to visit us again, <laughs> and then to try to confront him on the home terrain and try to see um, what was the misunderstanding or If he wouldn't reply to our invitation to visit us again, then we would try to confront him about the issue via email or something. And then finally, if that wouldn't give us any result, then we would uh, uh, try to find the editor of the uh, journal where information was published and uh, express our side of the story and maybe have the editor contact the doctor visitor to see what was it all about. Mm -hmm. We would also contact his university mm -hmm. and we would also try to explain this to uh, professional associations, whatever, so that, because we don't want that other people fall into the same trap. Right. If he didn't provide us a good explanation, why do you think he did it? Because maybe was doing this research before us and was simply dragging the publication and when he saw that we are also recognized, so he decided 
the latest time that he published something he was doing many years ago. We don't know. Mm -hmm. to ask this question. Mm -hmm. And so related to the four questions that you gave us, yeah, we think our parents would be satisfied <laughs> with our decisions. We would definitely be able to sleep at night, uh, excluding the, the hostage scenario. And uh, <laughs> if everybody did that, we think it would be a good choice. And we believe it's greatest good for greatest number, I guess, because uh, so we would discourage this behavior that is not acceptable or not desirable. Yes, yeah, very good. Awesome. Thank you, Yuri. All right, who's the speaker for your group back here? Anna, right? Anna? Yeah, Anna. Okay. And did you consider any of the four? Um, yeah, we, we considered, but uh, um, we kind of thought that it uh, depended on the character of mm -hmm. the person. Um, so, yeah. so one of the things that this illustrates is that it's a hard problem. And there's no, there's no one answer. It's a hard problem. And Sonia has experienced it. Sonia, right? Okay. It's experienced this problem. And a lot of people have experienced this problem, and it makes them angry to have their work ripped off, as I would say, stolen. Uh, this group came up with a solution that is sort of sometimes called public shaming. Public shaming has the result of discouraging other people from doing the same thing. And, I, and that is a good outcome to discourage others from doing the same thing because then, well, certainly the question is of what if everybody did this with regard to the stealing, it would be a disaster. No one would have any incentive to, um, to do any research if other people would just steal their ideas and they would get no credit for it. And a lot of us have had great ideas. You might have a great idea in a meeting, and you say your idea, and then the next person says your idea, and that person gets the credit, especially those of us who are women. We experience saying something, and then somebody else, a man, says the same thing, and everybody goes, oh, yeah, Frederick's idea is wonderful. What? I thought that was my idea. <laughs> it happens. It happens in little situations, and you want to discourage that. So um, anyway, so that's, that's about public shaming. But it is a very hard problem, and the consequences are something to consider. What are the consequences if you decide to take this guy on? And figuring out how you're going to do it. Now, you, your group chose to do it in a private email. This group chose public. Uh, it's all. It's all up out there for choice. Those are all choices. So I want to say this. And let me ask first, does anyone have any questions? OK. I want to say this. What I just did was I gave you an example of how to encourage critical thinking, creativity, engagement, group problem solving, and ethics how to do that in your class. So that, that, was, that was the example. I teach by example a lot. So you just got an example. <laughs> Hope it helps. All right, I'm going to wind it up. I just have a few more slides. Um, yep. So, oops, too far. So there are some more ways that you can use to help your students with critical thinking skills and the creativity and, and all the things we've just been talking about. And one of them is cooperative learning. We just did that. You were learning in a cooperative way. You assigned teams. And one th there's a few things to think about with assigning the teams. One is to team up both strong students and weak students in the same team. Why is that? It's because 
the weak students will learn from the strong students, and the strong students will learn even better. They'll learn even more deeply. Now, I was always a strong student, and believe me, I did not want to be on any teams with any weak students. I like not want that. They're not going to help. They're going to slow the process down. So you have to explain how it's of value to them. Because if, it, if you're telling me to be on a team with weak students, I'm going to be crabby about it and not happy. Sonia? Oh, no, no, no. Make as many as you like. Yeah. Yeah. Um, <laughs> to promote cooperation, don't assign grades on a curve. Suppose you sign grades on a curve, and I'm in a class with Prodrag, and he's the smartest person in the room, and I'm the stupidest person in the room. And I go to him, and I say, can you help me understand this? Well, if I'm assigning grades on a curve, he has an incentive not to help me. Because if the, if the class is weighted on a curve, if I don't know anything, then that puts me lower and puts him higher. But if I learn stuff from him, then that puts me higher and it balances out and makes his grade a little less. If I grade absolutely, then there's no cost to him other than his time to help me. And it's of benefit to the whole team if each person helps the others. Does that make sense? I found that non-intuitive at first, but now I understand it. Um, ah, explain how you are doing will lead to improved learning. And here's an important point. Everybody, when they go to work, is going to work in a team. They're going to work in teams. They might be the smartest person on the team, and they might have weaker people on the team. They need to learn how to, how to work in that situation. So you're helping them to be prepared for the working world. More ways. Uh, provide online work that allows the students to interact with their work. And that is, you know, you can try certain approaches and you get an online response to whether that approach is working or how it works or what the outcome is. That's, that's one way, and I think you guys are already doing that in your class. Um, and let students participate in the performance assessment. This is to help you reduce your grading load. So uh, there's ways to reduce the load on you for grading, and this is really true if you have a class of, say, 700 students. But this I found really interesting. This is um, the student grade versus the teacher grade. And what you can see is that it's pretty close and pretty parallel. So uh, this is an article called The Impact of Self and Peer Grading on Student Learning by Sadler and Good in the journal Educational Assessment. So I thought that was a really important thing to know, that peer grading and self-grading are not off the mark by much with, uh, with the teacher assessment. So important to know. So now I'm going to ask you to decide. Not to decide is to decide. That's what I said at first, and, and I'll just rehearse that a little bit. When you're given an opportunity to make a choice, if you just say, I can't figure this out, I can't face it, I'm not going to decide, I don't want to think about it, it's hard, you are essentially letting fate or someone else decide for you. You're letting that opportunity go by. You're not participating in that opportunity. So I want you to take the choice and decide. So what will you decide to use from what we just talked about? Will you use some more ways that you can engage your students in small groups? Will you use the way we just learned that ethics lesson? 
Will you use some more other ways to use critical thinking skills? What, and this is not just a ridiculous question. What will you, what will you use tomorrow? What will you use next semester? You're all letting fate decide for you. <laughs> Maybe you can think about it and come up with ideas of what you will decide. So you can contact me, and I want you to feel free to contact me. I have no problem responding to people by their um, by email and helping them work through a problem. I like doing that. I find that people typically work through the problem themselves as they describe it, and I can just listen. I can be the sounding board, and I'm happy to help you work through your work through any issues and problems that you have. So thank you very much, and uh, let me know if you have some questions. Questions? Before those shy people decide, I will ask questions. Okay, good. Um, I knew I could count on you. When you introduce problem-based learning, what are the typical obstacles and problems you can expect? Some students don't want to learn that way. They just want lectures. That's what they're comfortable with, and they don't want to think about it as a problem they have to solve. So that problem, I think, is best overcome by explaining why this is valuable to them. Uh, what problems do you encounter with teaching problem-based learning? Similar. Similar? Yeah. It, what only, solutions? They don't do this. If you teach them in, in, in such a manner and later ask them to evaluate uh, how much did they learn, was it a good teaching, um, the, the, they've been so trained that they believe the only good learning is when somebody is throwing at them a lot of facts. Mm -hmm. So if you just this same period of time, like 45 or 90 minutes, if you do one or two problems, they don't feel that they have gained much. Even mm -hmm. if they say, oh, it was good, it was nice, you liked it, you learned something, but when you ask them, did you learn a lot? Well, not, not that much. So another they question, don't value it. Yeah, they don't value it. Uh, another question is, <coughs> uh, is there any advice of a, any sort, general sort, or specific uh, to teachers uh, how to find a problem. You know, I, need, I need to teach them this. This is my schedule for today, but I won't give them all these details. I will try to find an important problem. How to hmm. find the right pro problem for the topic I'm supposed to teach? This is the, the most frequent question I get from, from people where I advocate problem with learning. Yeah. Any general type of advice? I have found that there are some websites that I can go to to get some ideas, uh, but in general, I don't have any advice for that. That's, that's, that's a hard question. Um, I will say this, that all of the work that I do in teaching, I use real examples from my own uh, background, all those years teaching, all those years doing, as a computer scientist and programmer, um, the example I used today was not my own, but I, I had a similarly close example, and so I, I did use that one. But I, so for problems for me, I, I always use, go to the real problems from the work that I have done. I, use, I think using real problems is, is very important. I never use made up problems. I never use silly problems. I remember once I had an interview for a company as a, a programmer, consultant, and they asked me, what was the value of having round um, holes in the ground for su the sewer lines as opposed to a square well, I'm like, what? <laughs> this is a ridiculous question. <laughs> and, and the answer was that if it's round, it won't fall through. But to me, it was just not touching on the reality of the work I did. And I remember it because I thought it was so insane. <laughs> so 
So that's why I stick with very sane, very practical, very real problems. And I was glad that, glad and sad at the same time that Sonia said, this is my problem. And I always have people in my classes say, this happened to me, or this happened in my workplace, or I know this problem. And so that's, that's what I would choose if that helps at all to answer your questions, is use real problems that you've encountered that incorporate that learning. It's not easy though, that's a hard one. So Sonia? the reason why you choose this uh, problem for us so often also uh, in the Western Oh yes, I encountered it. I've encountered it several times. I, I've encountered it as I, I was the VP of publications for an IEEE society and I dealt with that with uh, people's articles that were submitted and I dealt with plagiarism. Um, yeah. And in classes I dealt with Typically plagiarism without a, without attribution uh, from students, and so you know I've seen it myself. I hadn't. I was trying to find an example that would be specifically for faculty dealing with other faculty. So that's why I chose that one. Okay, so it's that. Yeah, but I, I'm also considering uh, always my audience. What's my audience? What do they care about? What, what problem is going to work for them? One more from Sonia. <laughs> uh, um, I have one dilemma. For example, if uh, you have uh, some e-learning project, and uh, in this project, uh, for example, you are sequencing a big part of uh, DNA, mm -hmm. part, by, part by part, mm -hmm. with students. And uh, what, for example, this uh, turns out to be something uh, that, can be, that can make money. That can be what? That can make money. Oh, that can make money. Okay. And uh, so many people, for example, students or of different ways, mm -hmm. uh, are, uh, were working on this piece. So uh, is there a way that these students uh, also yeah, that's a that's a really good question, and so, and it's a question that it's as that I can't, so, no. yeah. So, so does your university have any policies with respect to um, spinning off companies? That would be the first thing I would want to know. It makes sense for universities to encourage commercialization and for them to retain a benefit. The university retains a benefit, but the students who then go on to commercialize or the faculty who then go on to commercialize the, ben the, the idea that they should have a financial benefit as well. And what the split is, whether it's 50-50 or something else, that's, that's up to the university, but there's a benefit. The university can be gaining more funds by essentially spinning off uh, companies that are using the ideas that the students got while they were students. Does that make sense? Yeah. 
I think, I think it's really a, a useful way for universities to promote their work. Other thoughts? I'll oh, answer the call of the I don't know if I mentioned the category anymore. Yeah, I was thinking about the question. So you mentioned briefly in uh, self and peer grading, mm -hmm. um, uh, which is um, uh, a very relevant thing, at least for, for better than me. Uh, for the, the first semester course we have with uh, 700 students, uh, I wanted to ask you. Some practical experience uh, with um, uh, sort of peer assessment or peer review, and uh, what do you think about using this tool or this method uh, in uh, some of your assessments, so in, so that it contributes to the final uh, course grade? Yeah, I have a little experience with it, and it's from a long time ago. But I have very little experience with that. And when I read this article that said that the, the, uh, the faculty assessment and the student assessments were very close, I was really impressed and happy to learn that because I thought that, that can be a huge advantage for faculty to be able to use that and then to maybe take that and, and take some samples and and rate them, are they close or far, and see how, how that works and give the students more feedback on did you get close or are you way off in your assessment. But uh, let, me, I, let me, I forgot to say this and this is really an important point. This, the assessments cannot be on uh, multiple choice questions and true false questions. They have to be on something that involves thinking and, and creativity so that you, they could then ask the other student, why did you think this? Why did you come up with this answer? That's the way the students are going to benefit from assessing another person's work. They're not going to benefit if it's a yes, no question. And obviously you've addressed that with online grading uh, or automated grading. But if it's a question like the one that we just had with the um, with a stealing of ideas, then you can ask each other, well, what made you come to that conclusion? How did you get there? What were you, and that's the critical thinking and the creativity part. So what, how did you get that idea? So I think that it's a very useful thing for written and long answer forms. It's not useful at all for true, false, or a, B, C, D. <laughs> what are your thoughts, Yuri? Uh, I don't know. We, we're still experimenting with this. And uh, so far, it seems to me that um, yeah, even in our case, the grades that students give each other uh, are, um, are really correlated with the grades we would give them. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Just some something to feel bad. Um, yeah. But what we're not sure is uh, about their feeling of being assessed by people they consider equal or maybe even inferior. inferior. Yeah. We yeah. even had a question why should, we, why should I do your job? You're a teacher, <laughs> you are supposed to grade. <laughs> and, and the answer to that is you will learn from reading another person's. Yeah. Yeah, response. You get more ideas on how you could have, could have done the task right. uh, and so on. And this, uh, this points to something that I think has to be uh, addressed over and over and over again in a class, and that is explaining the benefit. When students expect that they're just going to be lectured to and given a lot of facts, like you said, they don't, they, there's an automatic disconnect with what's the benefit of me doing this problem-based learning or me doing this other student assessment or my having my work assessed by this stupid person, you know, 
that's not going to come off as an easy thing. And so it's very important to address that and repeat why this is going to be useful. This is working in small groups, solving problems is going to be useful because that's the way you're going to do it at work. You're not going to have a boss who tells you turn in a report by Thursday that gives this, this, this. That's not the way it works. So if they learn early on that there's that benefit, they're more comfortable with it. If they learn early on that there's a benefit from grading that you will learn more by assessing other people's work, then they can be more comfortable with it. But you really have to push on what's the benefit to them. Because they're, they're going to see it as, you're, I'm just doing your work. And you have to explain, that. no, you're not just doing my work. You're actually learning more. And yes, you're enabling me to teach more students. But, you are, but this is a way for you to actually benefit yourself. We both, we both win. Other? Yes. Mm -hmm. So they are used to being teamed up with whoever, like a lottery, you know, mm -hmm. to, to come up. But um, I think that not everybody accepts this reasoning. Mm -hmm. Because they, they would say, okay, you know, this is this narcissistic thing, like me, me, me. I, yeah, you're telling me that I'm going to learn more, but I already know that. So I'm wasting my time to help others. Mm -hmm. Excellent academically, and what kind of people they are is another question. But uh, we also see that such narcissists get to the top exactly by repeating this behavior, mm -hmm. you know, walking over that body yes, that we yeah. say, that's an expression. <laughs> so uh, how how can you actually transfer this message, or is it, is it basically not worth it? Because this is maybe also you know there's always a, there's also yeah. Uh, cost benefit analysis. If I have to spend 15 minutes to explain to somebody why he or she should do that, maybe I should spend 15 minutes to, to talk to others who want to go along with this approach and just give this person do whatever they like. So, what, what would you what, what would you suggest to, to do in such a situation where you have a non homogeneous yeah. group with different ideas and views of how they should do these things? First, I want to say, ask, are there any people in the room who um, have great ideas to answer that question? All right. Um, I'm not sure I have any great ideas, but the approach I would take would be uh, the common knowledge approach. So you, you try to avoid teaching people individually because it's better if they have common knowledge. Everybody knows what everybody else has learned. Um, something I learned in distributed computing theory. So, um, what I would do is perhaps find a video that would show them that there is this benefit when they get to the work world. I would try to find some way to show them. And I'll look for that. And if I can find it, I will, I will send it to your eye and he can get that to you. But um, but I would look for something that would explain it for me because when I as a professor try to explain something to the students and they think it's just something to benefit me, then they're going to see it as uh, self-interested and they're going to pay less attention. If I can find something. I, I tend to learn by reading, but I know that the young people learn by watching videos. 
So I, that's why I say I would look for a video that would explain it and get, get capture their attention. Uh, I have one idea. Uh, do you think that you could maybe uh, again create a problem or challenge and uh, let them discuss among themselves? If you have a heterogeneous group, let them discuss some issue so that they see that they have different views, different opinions. Oh, what a wonderful very, idea. That there is a merit of going in. Mm -hmm. So there is this group dynamics take place. And we are very used to that way of thinking. But for students, they, they make it work with one person, another person, you know. When you put a group together, sometimes they don't work as a group. They don't have this feeling that they should work as a group. So this is yeah. um, what, what I have just observed sometimes. And it's kind of, well, I mean, we, we work with those situations and we deal with it. Why not that I wrote myself here? Uh, just a few minutes ago, as in, in this lecture that we have on freshman this course, we have one group exercise. The group is first we let them first year we let them choose their own group. Mm -hmm. Now we said no way, and we created an algorithm based on personal private data. <laughs> we go through the, our administration so that we create as heterogeneous group as possible from different cities, different schools, different grades, different as different as possible, as heterogeneous. But we have one exercise, and the, the note I wrote to myself, could we organize everything they have to do in the homework as a group work? And each time a different group. So you're completely right. Group dynamics are strange and crazy things. Sometimes you have a, a, a very bright person who is also a strong personality, and he will lead the group into success. Sometimes you have a very strong personality who will lead the group into disaster. Mm -hmm. so, the, the simple thing that I can think of is distribute the danger by creating different groups. So if we have, I don't know, 13 courses or 15, let them work in 10, at least in 10 different groups. So statistically, they should have all the experiences. Because they also have to experience that somebody is leading them into disaster. Uh, there's a great exercise that you have in, in those management uh, courses that teach you management and, and things. It, the exercise is usually like this. You get a small video or, or, or uh, paper which says you, the group, are uh, traveling on a small private plane and the plane crashes over a desert. The crew is killed, but you, the group, survive. And here's the list of items that you can find in the debris of the plane. You can keep only six, seven, ten. Choose which you will keep and choose your strategy. Are you waiting for the rescue or are you going to try to find your way out to the civilization? And you are first supposed to do this exercise by yourself, and then later you work as a group, and again put on the paper what is your decision. Then you see a video of an expert explaining you what is the right choice, and then you grade. How well did you do as a personal, and how well did you do as a group? And I had a privilege doing this in a, a large group of 100 people, where uh, we had 12 groups of eight. So we had 12 types of outcomes. One outcome, everybody would survive. And then when they were working together, they went even better. Another group, everybody would survive, but working as a group, they all died. <laughs> <laughs> everybody would die, and the group, they would do even worse. Or everybody would die, but in a group, they survived. And all types of combinations they were, you know. You, you see, again, this strong individual who is very capable and helping others to learn, or a strong individual who is actually uh, helping others not to learn anything. So this group dynamics is a very strange thing, and all the things can happen. And the only strategy that comes to my mind is put them in many different groups. Uh, yeah. I can't think of anything else. One of the recommendations that I found in the literature was to have them be in one group and tell them up front, we're going to have groups that last for four weeks. And at the end of the four weeks, the groups will be dissolved. You can choose to keep your group together if everyone votes to keep your group together. So you can have some group selection 
opportunities or opportunities to get out of that group and you know what time frame it is. So if you're in a group that has a leader who's leading you into disaster, you can say, I'm out of here and <laughs> go to another group. Um, but if everyone agrees to be in that group, you can keep the group together. That's one choice, um, but uh, the choice of letting people experience different groups and explaining what the value is of that, um, it's, it's, that's an important value. I worked for a lot of startup companies, and I observed the leadership qualities and whether they, let, they were going to lead our group to success or failure. I was always the first person to quit. I was pretty well known as the canary in the coal mine because I would always leave. I would try to solve the problem, but if I couldn't solve it, I would say, all right, this is going to fail. I'm going to try another, another group or another company because I was observing the behavior of the group and the dynamics, and I always wanted to, I wanted to get out if it wasn't going to be successful. And, and that's the kind of example I would use to teach students about being observant. You're in a group. What do you see? Is this going to succeed or fail? And if it's going to fail, you want to, you can try your best to make it succeed. And I always try. Did not. I, after, after that experience, I figured I needed to learn better persuasive communication skills. So I tried. I could see what this, the problem was, but I was never able to persuade the leaders that they uh, should make certain changes. So I learned from it. Um, but anyway, that's a kind of example you can give your students that you have to learn because this is what you're going to face in work in a work situation. And this will help prepare you for that. I wish I had great answers for you, but I don't have great answers. I don't think that there is a solution yeah. for them in terms of their change of opinion. But I think that's, that's probably the, the key summary. And that's partly why I gave you the um, ethics question that I gave you. There's no one silver bullet answer. There were a lot of answers. And it depended on the individuals involved in the teams. Uh, and I think that's an important lesson for people too. There are a lot of problems that don't have one answer. And that's um, something that engineers don't particularly like. I, mean, I, I loved algebra. I could always solve it and then check my answer. That was great. I could check my answer. I could substitute in the values for the variables. And that's what engineers like. They like things that are clear and have clear outcomes. And so I think it's important to teach engineers that, yes, engineering gives you the opportunity to solve clear and straightforward problems. But you will also encounter those that don't have a clear and straightforward answer. And so even though you don't like them, we can prepare you to be more successful if we prepare you to deal with that and learn how to deal with that. I hope that helped. <laughs> All righty. No more questions. Well, I want to thank you guys for being a great class. You were such a, a good class with so many good ideas and uh, such good participation. So. Thank you. Oh, thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thank you to everybody. And uh, we meet in the last, uh, our regular meeting next month. And then we have summer break. We had how many lectures in the past three years? Something almost 40 well, lectures in three year, years. Like yeah, uh, they're all recorded and uh, occasionally go browse through the yeah. knowledge that we have accumulated there. Yeah, that's good. Yeah. We will also post videos from the yesterday's um, session in, in uh, Mipro. Uh, the lectures we recorded there and we'll post them. So it will be on IEEE site, since IEEE 
jointly organized this event yesterday, and we will continue doing so. And one thing that uh, Yuri and I, Yuri and I uh, realized yesterday is that what we will try to do in the future, we'll try somehow to first out reach out to the people who actually do some changes, modifications in their teaching, and we'll try to help them understand how they can publish their research, because usually we are not rewarded for doing any changes in education. But uh, uh. All, all effort in education can also be reported as a research in a, in a way. We can, we can help you understand how to do that. And uh, we hope that in that way, more people will be encouraged to, uh, to do the research and then publish and that our body of knowledge will grow. So uh, this is one of the things we'll do. And hopefully, we'll have also a webinar from some people, uh, actually, that also have such, have such webinar for IEEE about public, uh, publishing, publishing uh, research in education. Okay. Uh, incidentally, these are the same people I was listening to at CEFI conference, the European Conference on Engineering Education. So obviously, we are on the right track, and they promised they will give us a lecture. So we'll continue doing so. Thanks. And thanks to the internet audience. It was also great. Excuse me. Now, for example, somebody, uh, as I'm uh, outside of it, uh, how can I get this information that you said about the uh, Mm -hmm. Just uh, follow us. Page. Just follow us on IEEE.hr, and then you find the section for uh, the, 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 the chapter. The chapter. The chapter for education. education chapter. And, uh, and all those videos. Also. Yeah. Yes. Everything. IEEE Croatia Education Obrazovanje, and you'll find it. <laughs>